Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, We will be hitting four verses this morning. Uh, I was planning on hitting 15, but I thought I'd break it up right here because we see the first four verses dealing with the disciples that Jesus calls, you know, Peter, Matthew, and all those guys. And then from 5 to 15, we actually see uh, them go out, and Jesus kind of directs them as they go out what to do, what to bring, and, and so forth. So I broke that up in its context for you. But let me, let me say this to start <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 10, 1 through 4. Uh, there are no, there are no nobodies in the kingdom of God. A nobody is a somebody in the kingdom of God. Let me let me say that again because I know that it, you have to hear it again. There are no nobodies. Uh, there are no nobodies. You're not a nobody. You are a somebody in the kingdom of God. God loves you. He cares for you, and He has called you into the kingdom of God. And that truly is love. For a God to be concerned about me as an individual, especially when you see such a huge world and you think there are more important things out there to do than to be concerned about me, that truly is love. For God to pinpoint and point you out specifically and work in your life in such a way that he takes you and he helps you realize that you are a somebody. Because this world wants you to think that you're a nobody. That you are just a glob that came out of the ocean and was evolved into this animal that you are to this day with no meaning, no purpose in your life. And God says, no, I have created you in creation. And you are very much valued by me. And I do have a purpose and a plan and a hope for you. And so every one of us, Every one of us is a somebody. And so this morning I, I themed it, and I kind of like that, that theme, the Fantastic Twelve. Uh, you look at the twelve uh, disciples and you kind of scratch your head, and what's so fantastic about them? <laughs> you know, um, Because you see some of them who were called like fishermen and uh, political uh, anarchists, you know, a tax collector who everyone hated, and guys that you don't even know anything about uh the scriptures don't tell us about it they seem like they're nobodies they're just kind of a part of the group you know but yet they're fantastic twelves because they go on to do some amazing works through the power of the holy spirit Uh, when a person is yielded to god completely surrendered asking god show me direct me lead me i will follow you boy they can do some awesome things but until you surrender yourself and totally put your faith and trust in him with your life he can't use you because you will sit at home dwelling on yourself in your situation and being useless and god doesn't want that for you he wants you to take steps of faith and oftentimes before god will bring healing to you you have to take a step of faith to serve him before god begins to change your life situation you have to take a step of faith in obedience towards him because he wants you to see the victories that he gives you in your life. As we um, begin chapter 10, we ended off in chapter 9, verse 38, where the Lord said to pray to God for the harvest was huge and there needed to be laborers, laborers. And so uh, chapter 9 at the end there kind of goes with chapter 10 in that Jesus now is going to prepare the laborers for the harvest. Here Matthew records an official list of Jesus' 12 primary disciples. And so he lists those disciples for us to see here. Uh, Later, he calls them apostles. Apostles are those that are sent out into the field. Let me break this chapter up for you so that... um, so that you get an idea of the context of what's going on here. As I said earlier, 1 through 15 is the calling of the 12 disciples and the sending of them out. And then we get into verse 16 uh, on to 26, actually to 31, and we see the coming persecution that will come upon the disciples, but Jesus is encouraging them to not fear, but to trust in him. And they're going to need that strength and that confidence that God will get them through because once he ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1 
And they wait up there in the upper room, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then they go out into the world alone with faith and trust that the Holy Spirit is with them. And then we see verse 32, actually all the way to 42, where men will confess Christ um, before men. And so the goal of Christ again is to get men to surrender their lives to, to Jesus. So. So let's look at the, uh, the 12 disciples here. Let's read verses one through four. I'll point out a couple of things and then we'll get into it. <clears throat> Verse one, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. I want you to highlight in your Bible, verse one, where it says, his 12 disciples. See that where it says his, capital H is is pointing to Jesus, uh, giving him the capital. And in fact, anytime we use God's name, we should always capitalize the first letter. It's Jesus' name, or if if it's God, there's no little G. Uh, There's always capital there. Uh, Jesus is letting us know that these disciples are his. They're his. They belong to him. He called them. He equipped them. He's going to train them, and he's going to send them out. And so they're his. They're they're his children. They're his men, just like you are his. And, And we need to realize that we are his. He has us in his hands, and he loves us, and he cares about us, and he Uh, wants to work with us and for us and wants to bless us and help us to have a prosperous life, a peaceful life. But we need to understand that we're his, we're his, and we need to go to him. We need to humble ourselves before him. Uh, We can't do it without him because without him, we're not his. And so we need to be his. So know that you're his and you can cry and, and go to his feet and ask and plea and beg for him to help you because you are his. He paid for you by his blood by his sacrifice on the cross because he loved you that much. You're not worthless. You're not no good. You have purpose and you have value. And God knows that. And he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And it says he gave them power. It wasn't their power. It wasn't their strength. (laughs) Can you imagine Peter? I got an idea. Could you imagine Matthew? I know we can get some resources here. You know, you can almost imagine them trying to take over But no, God says, no, let me, let me handle it. I will give you power. I will direct you. I will guide you. I will give you the strength. I will give you the might. I will give you the ability. I will give you everything that you need. You don't have to depend on your flesh. You don't have to depend on your strength. You don't have to depend on anything that you specifically have in yourself. Chuck used to always say, that is not ability. It is not the ability that God is looking for. It is what? The availability the availability, right? And so you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't really, you know, I don't have any gifts. I don't really know too much. Um, I've never organized anything before. Uh, I've never ran anything. And God says, great, I can use you because now you have no resources whatsoever. So let me give you those resources. And oftentimes it's a matter of just getting up and doing it. We were talking about this at the men's breakfast, a couple of the guys, about how you can feel lazy and, and to do something. And it's not until you actually start doing it that all of a sudden the energy and, and the confidence and, and the, the drive to complete that task comes. Not until you start it that all of a sudden the laziness goes away. And, and so you can be lazy and you can sit there and do, oh, I just don't want to do this. Oh, I don't. And, and all the excuses, oh, I've already done it this week. I've been doing too much and I need to relax. I get a day for myself. All of that stuff definitely has a play. And you will. You will relax and you will do nothing. But if you get up and just start going, all of a sudden God gives you that strength that you need. So remember that you're his, that he gives you the power 
And, and notice here, it's the over the unclean spirits, casting, healing, and so forth. At least that was for the disciples. And so we see these 12 men that are called. Now, let me get into today's message. We can find this reference in Mark chapter 6 and also Luke chapter 9. You can also find it in Acts if you want to see a list of the disciples in other places. Now, when did this take place? <clears throat> when did Jesus call them? It was shortly after the Passover, uh, after the feeding of the 5,000. We find that in Luke chapter 9. Uh, we will take a look at 12 disciples that Christ called, and we will see that Christ has empowered them before he sends them out into the world. We need to take the time to learn about the truth before we just go out into the world and, and apply what we feel is the truth. We need to be discipled. And that's what church is all about. It's about discipling uh, men and women in the kingdom of God. When we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the next step after that is to be discipled of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that, that are in us, all of us and me, that we have brought from the world. We have brought from our families and our social backgrounds, our friends. And a lot of it is garbage. A lot of it is worthless. And we need to kind of sift that stuff out Get it out of the way and focus on what the word says and replace those values, those things, uh, those ideas, those philosophies with what scripture says. And so we need discipleship. We need to know how to do certain things. We can't just go out there. We can have all the zeal in the world, but without knowledge, it's not going to amount to anything. We need, to, we need to have some knowledge of the truth. And Jesus is taking time, right, with the disciples. He's training them. He's living with them, and they're watching him. And you need to do the same thing here. You need to be a part of the church. You need to watch the leadership. You need to see how we serve the Lord, and then get involved in doing the same. There is power that can be had as you study and seek the Lord and then apply uh, that application to your life. Some of us, though, we, we do go out without power, and so we become discouraged <clears throat> because nothing's happening. And yet we went out too soon. We didn't go at the right time. Uh, some of us have the truth, <clears throat> and yet we don't even go out at all. We don't do anything at all. We're too busy with our own, own families, uh, with our own lives. Um, at this missions conference, I didn't want to talk too much about it, but um, I tell you, this last conference that I went to, I was just really moved at the courage of some of these missionaries, what they're doing in some of these third world countries. I'm not talking about Europe. I mean, it's a great work. We met a couple that, that are ministering in Ireland, uh, Europe, Germany, and those places, Russia. Uh, and it, it's, it's almost, uh, I don't know, I haven't been there, but it, it's not too bad. It, you know, it's kind of, people go there for vacation. You know? so, but the people that go to Africa, to Sudan, to, to Hades, uh, to Nepal, uh, to some of these places, Guatemala, uh, places where there's nothing. Uh, those people, and usually they're very young men and women that are going out there, and they're committing themselves, they're trusting in the Lord. They're by themselves, out there by themselves, in the middle of nowhere, with family and so forth. They have learn the truth they have studied it and now they're applying it by going out there and boy they have some courage i was listening to some stories I'm like wow that is amazing it was getting me excited about what god can do because we sometimes forget in america what god can really do why do we forget because we have everything already i don't need to pray for a mule to get from one place to another because i have a car and so what need is there to pray for transportation when we have a car just get in it and go. I don't need to pray for my meal because I get a meal. It's everywhere. You can go anywhere at any time to get a meal. Over there, you got to kill your meal. You got to find your meal. You got to hunt for your meal in some places. So <clears throat> we have it easy in America uh, compared to some of those people. They made those choices to go out there, and it's they are courageous people. The disciples were in preparation here, and the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus Christ would be Useless to the world, <clears throat> useless uh, <clears throat> unless the world knew or knows about it. And so the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's the power. 
The power is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and get into this, verse one. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him. Now Jesus took about a year and a half to complete his choices and disciples. It wasn't like one day he just began to choose them. You remember he's been he's been walking through Capernaum and Galilee and going up to Gennesaret in that area. Men are following him, women are following him, and he's ministering to them and now he's looking and he's seeing who is ready to follow him and he's beginning to choose out those men. Much like what we do today in Calvary chapels. <clears throat> We see all the men, we see all the women, we see who's in church, we see how faithful they are to be in church and how regular they are. We, we see their commitment to the Lord. We see by their language, by what they say, by what they do and how they respond. You know. And then we look at that and we say, Lord, there's an anointing on one here. There's an anointing over here. Uh, they seem to be really gung-ho. They seem to get it. They seem to be in the right direction. And so we need to help them now to fulfill their calling. And so Jesus was basically doing that. He was watching the crowds. Of course, you, you might even say, but boy, the men he chose <laughs> wasn't a really good choice, but he knew their hearts because he was God. So it took him about a year and a half. And then they were with him for about two years. <clears throat> Jesus had many, many disciples to choose from. He had probably called John, Andrew, Simon, Philip, Nathaniel, probably about eighty twenty six. When you do the calculation in history and the events that took place and you look back, you can kind of pinpoint those areas plus or minus a year. And then it was two years later that all of a sudden he called Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And then in 29, in, in eighty twenty nine was when he literally sends them out where we're at at this point. So it's probably right there around 29 years after the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, that he uh, begins to uh, send the disciples out. A year later, Jesus gives them the great commission to go out into the world and make disciples. And so these 12 men were, were fashioned to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And so are we fashioned to be witnesses of that great love of Jesus Christ. Every one of us, when we accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts, and, and the primary reason that we do that is what? For eternal life. I have to say that, that when I did it, it was because I wanted to go to heaven and know that my sins were forgiven, that I get to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to hell. I don't want to be eternally separated from the Father. And so I accepted Jesus Christ because I wanted to go to heaven. And most people do. They don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven. And so if Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and there's no other way to the Father except through him, then I need him in my life. And so we accept him. But it stops there with so many people. Now God wants to take us and he begins to fashion us after the image of his son. And this is where God begins to work in our individual lives, where he challenges us. He allows things to take place in our lives, the sufferings, the pain. He blesses us so we see that blessings come from him. He leads and guides us. He wants to create a personal relationship with us at all times. And that's what he's doing here with the 12 disciples. I want to make three points this morning. One is that you're called. Every one of us in this room is called to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's called justification. Point two, every one of us here is called to labor in the kingdom of God. That is called sanctification. And every one of us, last point, is called to heaven. That's called glorification. <clears throat> what does that entail? <clears throat> I am called to Jesus Christ. That is, I am called to a personal relationship with him. This is not a church that teaches about religion. We don't teach about sacraments, sacrifices, offerings. We don't teach about living in such a way that you will be pleasing to God so that he'll allow you to get to heaven. We teach that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that we are justified. Justification is a theological word and it's used in that context that God calls us to be justified with him through the work of his son Jesus Christ alone. And this is the work that is done by God and God alone. It has nothing to do with us. And we have to realize that our salvation... Our eternal life is done completely by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Otherwise, why did Jesus die on the cross? 
There would be no reason for him to die on the cross. And so that has to mean something. It has to mean a lot. And that cross today is vacant because he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Justification is the judicial act of God by which he pardons all the sins of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Even us believing and having faith in him is from God. He gives us a measure of faith, enough faith to either accept it or reject it. That even comes from God. So in that relationship with Jesus Christ, that justification, it's a realization that we cannot do it ourselves, that it comes from God alone. And so no work, no sacrifice, no sacrament, nothing can save me. Only Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is liberating when you think about it. Because I don't have to do anything to have eternal life. It's already been done for me by Jesus Christ on the cross. I've been justified as though I have never sinned in my life. But all of you have to ask Jesus into your heart. You have to ask Jesus into your heart and become and allow him to become your personal savior. <clears throat> How many were listening to J. Vernon McGee this morning? He gave a great analogy of this. He was talking about the, the, the person that has been justified and how they've changed. And, and one, one analogy that he gave uh, was one of a young couple who were single and they met each other. And he, he kind of described it as a woman who was working eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, working very hard, <clears throat> meets a guy, and all of a sudden they fall in love and they get married and she doesn't have to work anymore. And she is so in love with this guy that she quits her job to spend as much time with him and to be a part of his life now. And he says, but yet she works more than when she worked before. Think about that for a second, because it's true. She worked her eight-hour job, she took care of herself, and then she came home and, you know, she was pretty much done. Had to do work around the house and so forth, I'm sure. But now she quits her job because she's in love and she wants to be with this person. And now she works even more because now she's got to get up in the morning and make him his breakfast, get him ready to go to work. And then she takes care of all the household items. And then when he gets home, she's there with his, her, his slippers and, you know, and whatever things that he may need. I know we live in a different society. You got to think of, uh, I, you got to think of, of J. Vern McGee's heir, you know, back in the, 60s and 70s because that don't happen anymore <laughs> unfortunately and, and then go on from there but let me i'll relate it to today you know my wife <clears throat> when i got a job with southern california edison uh, she didn't need to work and so she quit work periodically she would work for a year or two but then she ultimately quit but you know that woman works more uh, than i do <laughs> even though i worked uh at times 12, 16 hours a day, she was constantly working. And you see her today, she's constantly doing things here and there, whether it's a home, whether it's for people, whether it's, you know, at church. Uh, there were times where we had people living with us because we're trying to help them get off drugs, uh, get on the, <clears throat> you know, the right path. And, and she's a part of that, taking them places, unemployment, social security, various things, just constantly, constantly working. But that's what happens when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It, it doesn't seem like it's work because you're in love. That's the relationship. That's the call the disciples had with Jesus. They're all standing listening to him. Wow, who's this guy? Listen to his words. Look at what great power he has. We want to get to know him. And they became very personal to him. John, the apostle, amazing guy, hard guy, him and his brother. They were called uh, the bow anglers, they were angry. They wanted to call judgment. But by the end of their relationship with Jesus the, in their ministry, they became lovers of God and lovers of people. And so John could write things like, my little children. And you could see the compassion and love that he had for people because he had spent a lot of time with Jesus. And so the first one here is that we are called to him, to a personal relationship with him. And it's one that has to be one with studying his word, praying, sitting down at his feet, talking to him on a daily basis, getting really intimate with him like you would have with your wife or your husband. On any subject, on any situation, God is there. When this happens, we're totally sold out for Christ. We are totally, we, we can't think of anything else but Jesus. 
<clears throat> when things pop up, Jesus is always there. He's always in the forefront of our mind. We're, we're always thinking about his work. We're always thinking about his kingdom. We're always thinking about opportunities to share because that's what a relationship with him does. Paul tells us that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's the next step. Once we realize it's not our work, it's what Jesus has done, nothing that we've done, and boy, he took away all our guilt, all our sin, everything that we have committed that was so wicked, he's taken it all away and washed us. And now comes the labor. We're called to labor. That's sanctification. Sanctification is the devoting or setting apart of oneself to worship and serve God. Now, this is scriptural. And so every one of us should be set apart to worship God. And worship is talking about our daily living, that we're reflecting our love for him daily, whether we're alone or whether we're amongst people or at work. We should be reflecting Jesus Christ. And we should be serving God. That, that, this is a commandment, and it demands obedience. We have to have a ministry, and we should be serving the Lord. I know there are a lot that aren't. I understand that. I totally get that, and that's why the church is in, in the place it is. But it doesn't mean that it's not true. And if it is true, then a person who has been justified understands that and says, Lord, use me. I want to be used by you. Use me in whatever way that you want, and I will be obedient to you. Your life becomes a service to God. And God's plans begin to unfold in your life. It involves more than a moral reformation of character brought by <clears throat> the power of truth. It's the actual work of the Holy Spirit bringing the whole nature more and more under the influence of the new grace principles that God has implanted in your soul through justification. It really is. He brings more and more of his own nature in and we realize how wicked and how evil we really are that we want to serve him more and more. Uh, faith is instrumental in <coughs> securing this sanctification because we need to trust in God and our relationship with him. It brings believers into a living contact with truth whereby he yields or we yield in obedience to the commands and embrace the promises of God for this life that which will come. When you read the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he, he calls Abraham to go out. He says, I want you to leave your people. See, this is the type of relationship that God has with us. He calls a man, he says, leave everybody. Don't take anyone. I want you to leave the land of Ur and just leave that place. I have a plan for your life. And the place that you're going to, you will be, you, your descendants will be more than the stars of heaven. Abraham believed God. And the Bible says it was accounted to him as righteousness because he believed what God said. And so he went. He brought Lot, though. He brought Lot. And that ended up being a thorn in his side, but something to be said about being obedient to the Lord. Uh, we were uh, listening to one of the stories of, of, uh, of a guy of Hades, and he said that uh, he was praying to the Lord because he got dropped off at Hades. He was all alone, and he just felt the Lord said, go. So he went with no help, no support, nothing. And he was like, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And, and, and so the Lord just says, okay, I'm going to give you uh, this house. And he gave him a vision of a house. And, and he saw it in his head. <clears throat> so, okay, Lord, I'm going to be obedient. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't even know where it's at, but I'll be obedient. So he's just kind of looking around trying to find the place. And this guy comes up and says, hey, I hear you're looking for a place. I got a place. I'll give you a great deal on it. Come and, come and uh, stay with me. The guy looks at him and, and he sees a place. He goes, nope, sorry. God didn't tell me that it was that place. It was another place. And so I'm going to wait on that. Didn't have any idea where it was at. Finally, he saw the place and he moved into that place. And so the enemy will even bring things that look like they're things that God is going to bless you with, but they're really not. Be obedient. Don't take lot. Don't take the other place. Be faithful to what God has told you to do and do it. Simple, plain, and clear. Now, those, the story continues. It, it turned out that it was a place that, that was um, owned by a religious <clears throat> leader in, in Hades. And this guy opened up the home, and not only the home, but he said, whatever you need to reach our people, you got it. So it's a pretty amazing story. So <clears throat> this is what God does in our sanctification. And then our glorification. 
our heaven. And this is pretty simple. I mean, we all get this. Ultimately, as we're serving him, one day God will take us from this earth and we'll be in his presence face to face. That's glorification. And by the way, that has nothing to do with us either. That's all the work of God. God is so good. He's done it all and prepared it all for us. So he gave them power. Look at the next verse or statement. He gave them power over unclean spirits that cast them out. Why did he give them power? To authenticate the message that he gave them. When you go out and you begin to perform these signs and these wonders, they will know that you come from me. And so we always give glory to him. So they had the power to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Pretty amazing when you think about it. If they had that power, we also have that power. I I don't believe that we have the power like they did in the sense that we can go around and constantly heal, constantly cast out, but we do have the power. Every person that I spoke to at that conference that, that ran into demon possessions, they all said, they can't touch us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And so they were subject to them. And they all had positive stories concerning how they exercised the demons from these people. Pretty amazing stuff. Why am I saying this? I want you to make sure you know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Because I can hear certain things from the church today and I can question mark. Either you're immature in the Lord or you haven't caught what God is trying to say to you. They had taken a couple of guys with them to, I believe, Hades that said that they were Christians. And when they got down into the field and began to minister... These two guys got demon possessed. But they're Christians. How can that happen? They're not Christians. They were dependent on something else. And so they had to spend most of the time getting the demons out of them and ministering to everyone else. That's some radical stuff, huh? (laughs) Imagine going over there. I'm a Christian. All of a sudden you get there and they possess you. Like, wait a minute. I thought I was. Where are you? No, you had religion. You had religion. That's not Christianity not Christianity. God gave them the authority and the power and they went out and they performed it. These men didn't have the authority of power. They only got possessed by it, by the enemy. Pretty amazing power that the church has. Let's continue as he begins to um, list uh, in verse two the names. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And again, you can see these in Mark 3, Luke 6, Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And so these are the names of the 12 apostles that Jesus Christ calls uh, pretty amazing men. I call them fantastic 12 because they did some fantastic things in their life. First was Simon Peter. It's not saying that he was the leader or anything. He's just saying he's the first one mentioned here. It, it could mean that, that he uh, has uh, some favor from the Lord, but I know that uh, Jesus seemed to discourage that a lot, right, when they wanted to sit his right hand and left hand and so forth. So I don't think that God would encourage uh, to, to try to be first. I think he, God would encourage to try to be last, if anything, at all. And so Peter is called first, which I find interesting because Peter did struggle with that a little bit. He always opened his mouth and and so forth. I I love the guy. I know we always talk some negative stuff about him, how he put his foot in his mouth, how he'd say things, but at least he was bold enough to take steps of faith and be available out there. And God used him in in great ways. Even later on in his life, uh, he struggled with... uh, with having relationships with, with, with people that weren't quite right, the religious leaders, the Judaizers, who are still uh, <clears throat> trying to keep some of the religion, circumcision, and so forth, and he was silent when Paul had to rebuke him. So said, no, no, you totally get it, Peter. You know it's by grace and not by works of circumcision. And he had to rebuke him a little bit, and Peter acknowledged that. And so he acknowledged uh, Paul's <clears throat> ministry also there. So one of the guys, the first guy mentioned is Peter, and then his brother Andrew, It's his blood brother here. They're related. I love the fact that God calls and he calls family. Uh, I got called. My wife got called. My children got called. And we're all still serving together except one of my sons. But he's serving in the kingdom of God. So we still are serving. And then our family members began to get saved. My sisters, my my, uh, (coughs) wife's sisters, (coughs) and so forth. And it just continues and continues. And I know many of you too. It's just how it works. It's how the Lord begins to work in the life of a believer. Then he calls James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And these two guys were also called sons of thunder. 
And so in the beginning, like some people, they get very zealous for the Lord. They're just like, oh, yeah, let's go do it. Let's get out there. Let's get on the field. Let's just, you know, annihilate them. And when evil comes, let's destroy it. Let's kill it. You know, and this, these guys were just gung-ho. So they got the, the, the nickname Sons of Thunder. But by the end of their ministry, John became well-known as the Beloved. And he's the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest. He's the one in, in the epistles of uh, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And just, he has such a love for the body of Christ that he calls them little children. He felt like he was a grandpa to them in a sense, a parent. And so he changes them. Philip and Bartholomew, um, we don't know too much about them. We don't know hardly anything about them. <clears throat> Bartholomew, the only thing we know is that the word and comes before his name. So he's always mentioned as and Bartholomew. There's Philip and Bartholomew. But you know, they're just as important, aren't they? I think they are. <clears throat> Brian Broson was sharing a quote, and I can't remember who it was from, but I thought it was so neat. You know, you, we, we have gardens in our yard, and we plant plants, and we look at them, and they're so beautiful, aren't they? When they grow and they just flourish. Tulip, you ever see a tulip? I love tulips. I wish it was cold enough here to see tulips all the time. Go up in the mountains and you'll see rows and rows of tulips if it's not snowing. And then just the, 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 the pinks, the whites, the reds, you know, and just like you see all that beautiful color. Or you get a bag of, of mixture of seeds and you just throw it out there and let, let just the beauty come up. <clears throat> and that's how the church is. <clears throat> you see the, the beautiful flowers. You see the work of God done in the Chuck Smiths and the Gray Glories and Raw Reese's and you go, wow. God really loves those guys. He's really empowering them. And you see the leadership in the churches and, and the elders and those that are serving. You go, wow, God really is using them. But God is using everyone. You know, there are a lot of flowers in the jungles that we don't even see, that we never hear of, but they're just as beautiful as the flowers we see. And there are a lot of Anne Bartholomew, Anne Smith, Anne Gonzalez, Anne, you know, there are a lot of them that nobody sees in Greater, I believe, is, is their reward because they're doing it without anyone knowing about it. They're out in the mission fields. They're out there serving the Lord, and yet they're not being glorified. <clears throat> Sometimes I think it's not Billy Graham, but it's those under Billy Graham who made it happen for Billy Graham that he may do that. I think of Randy and, <clears throat> and uh, what's his name? Stephen. No, I, I knew his name. And Stephen and, and those who prepare this place so that I can get here and, and teach, you know, so valued and great is their reward in heaven because they're so faithful to come in the morning and serve the Lord. And that's a service. That's a service to God. I know we don't like it because uh, it's not a, a place of prestige, a place where people can see you. But boy, I tell you, they are the flowers that are out there and God loves them very very much and then of course matthew the tax collector we spoke a, a lot about him james the son of alpheus and libius uh, whose surname is thaddeus uh, so they were probably the same this is libius was not judas or judas iscariot there <clears throat> and then of course simon the canaanite or the zealot he was a part of a group of, of uh, activists who were against rome and god had called him to become a disciple. This guy was extreme. He wanted to, to overthrow Rome if he could. And yet God touched his heart to not overthrow Rome, uh, but to um, preach the gospel of love to Rome. Later on, don't know a whole lot besides that he was a zealot. And then, of course, the last is Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. How'd you like to be known by that? You know, a little trailer at the end. Oh, yeah, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ. And it's in the word of God for eternity. And that, that is so sad. So much about him that we can learn from. Uh, he definitely was a religious man. He was doing things for specific reasons. And the reasons, you know, you could probably take a look at him and say, yeah, I totally understand. He loved his people. He wanted to see the Israel nation uh, liberated from the Roman government. And so he was hoping that Jesus was the king that would finally liberate them from the Roman government. We had a person here, very educated person. And it seemed like that's how they thought. It was about what Jesus was going to do for her people, for their people. You know, and that's not what it's about. It's what Jesus does for the world. Even for the most wicked person, he can save them from eternal damnation. So these are the men that Jesus called. Let me share a scripture with you that, that I find just so uh, encouraging. 
because I want you to understand that every one of you are valued and there are nobodies in the kingdom of God and he has a use for you. And if you don't think that he does, then you are not trusting in God. You are not believing his word because he's telling you he does and that he can use you. And you're basically saying, you're lying, God, because I'm not usable. And that is not true. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Write it down or turn to it if you want. But it says, for you see your calling, brethren. You see your calling. I just explained your calling to you right now. So every one of you are responsible for this now. You see your calling, brethren, sistren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. The majority of people who are called into the ministry are people that aren't great people. You have 12 disciples who weren't great people. I would possibly say that the Apostle Paul was a great man, very educated, uh, very well known. And he's a guy that if you were in the world and you say we want a leader, that would probably be the guy you want to choose. But Jesus personally chose 12 guys. Peter, you kind of smell like fish. Come on, follow me. Simon, you're always fighting against the rebels and the government and blah, blah, blah. You're always saying and voicing your opinion. Come here, follow me. You know, John and James, you guys are always like, want to throw lightning bolts at people. Come over here, follow me. You know, those are the guys you don't want. You know, Those are the preachers. Oh, no, no, those preachers are too hard. Oh, they say things that offend. Oh, they, they do this. and come, come follow me. Come follow me. He usually chooses men and women like us, like us. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. That's why he's chose us, so that when people see us, they go, wow, <laughs> it's got to be God, because it's not you. It's not you. I'm amazed when people say, good message, or God is using you. I'm like, really? Thank God then, because I don't get it. I really don't get it. I don't see it at all. But yet, God chooses the foolish things of this world. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty and the abased things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the despised, if you're despised by your family, if men hate you and don't like you, if you rub them the wrong way, Jesus is saying, come on, come follow me. I've called you. We need those guys once in a while, right? John the Baptist, rub people the wrong way. Get them motivated. Get them challenged in a sense. <clears throat> Despised, but yet God chose them. And the things which are not to bring the things, to bring the nothing, the things that are. Now listen to that again. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That is the things that you can't even imagine that God would do with you and through you, he will do them for you. Amazing, amazing. That no flesh should what? Glory, verse 29, in his presence. But of him you are Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. There we go. Justification, sanctification, glorification. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So what is our application? Here's my application, guys. Ladies, take a step of faith. Build that relationship with Jesus Christ. Get in a regiment where you're praying with him, studying him, and really focusing on building your relationship with him. Join us every night this week. Turn off channel 7 or whatever it is, 700 and something, at 7 o'clock for one hour. Come and just lay before the Lord. Surrender your hearts to him. A fast in whatever way that you, the Lord leads you, if you want a full fast without water and without food, hey, if Lord, the Lord is saying to do that, then do that. If the Lord is just saying no food, then do that. If he's saying no lunch, then do that. Whatever the Lord's telling you, make sure he's telling you that. Do it and come and just lay before the Lord. Seek him. Take that step of faith and then prepare. Prepare to serve him. Ask him, Lord, use me. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. And then you got to just trust him that he's going to work it out. It is a ministry of trust in him. You will see things that will blow you away. You will not agree with things. You will have uh, confusion, but you just trust him. You just trust him completely. Because 
It's about you and him and that faithful relationship.